Welcome back to My Seminary Life. I'm your host, Brandon Knight. This is Apologetics 201, and I thought we would keep the cult party going with this episode. Last week here on the show, we talked about Christian science. Partially because throughout this series we have been fo- on apologetics, we've been focusing on the relationship between faith and science, and it seemed like an opportunity to talk about a group that claims to be Christian and also scientific. And if you listen to the episode, you will discover it's not really either one of those. But also earlier this week, it w- the promo for the upcoming summer school series in June on the topic of cults dropped. So I thought it would be good if we continue to build hype for next month's series and to keep this apologetics conversation going by talking about today. So what do you do if you do run into somebody who's in a cult? What do you do? How? What do you say? How do you interact with somebody who may be or is <laughs> part of of a cult. What should you do in that scenario? And that's what I spent some time researching this week. And we're going to talk about a few key things to keep in mind if you end up talking to a cult, uh, somebody who is in a cult. And initially, you may think to yourself, Brandon, seriously, am I really going to run into people who are a part of a cult? It does depend on how broadly you define what a cult is, which is one of the key things to keep in mind is how do you define a cult? Because I have met people who their definition of a cult is so broad that they would say that the Catholic Church is a cult because of their veneration of Mary. I'm not going to go with the definition of a cult that broadly. Actually, I've talked about before how having a definition of a cult that is all in all encompassing you know like ca- characterizes every single cult that's ever existed is actually pretty difficult a a pretty popular one one that i've gone back to before is that a a cult is a re- new religious movement that has branched off from a major faith but has gone its own direction. So for an example, Jehovah Witnesses, Mormons, uh, Christian Science, these are all groups who branched off of Christianity, the major religious source, to move to their own completely different thing, but still have a little bit of Christian sources within it. Also, another example, because it's not always just Christianity, another example would be the Nation of Islam. The Nation of Islam is a cult that splintered off from Islam. They are two different things. They are not the same thing. They are two different things. The Nation of Islam is a cult that split off from the main religious source of Islam. The problem with this definition is that not every new religious movement that is a cult started off of from a major religion. Examples of that would be Scientology or Nexium. These groups are more so splintering off from pseudo-psychology. Not a religious movement. They're from what is supposed to be an alternative form of mental health care. Um, They're not, they're kind of religious. They function like religions. Nexium doesn't exist anymore, but it, it functioned like a religion, but it didn't come from a major religious source. Another one that's difficult to define, and we're going to talk about how uh, we're going to talk about one of these during the uh, cult series next month is Twin Flames universe, there's this whole big neo-paganism movement going on within the spiritual lives of many people right now. And in neo-paganism, it's basically a little bit of everything thrown into one big pot. It's not like we're we're deriving our faith from a major religion. It's kind of like a little bit of 
everything within, within neo paganism, and it, there's like a lot of like classic folkism and you know like witchcraft and things like that. But it's it's a little bit of everything. So this idea of like a new religious movement that splintered off from a major religion to go its own direction, um, you know, it it's a good definition. It does capture a lot of cult, but it's not a perfect one. That is important to know, though, you know, how you define a cult is going to answer your question of what is the pro- is going to help answer your question of what is the probability of me running into somebody who does participate in a cult? You might be in an area where it is common for you to get knocks on your door from Jehovah witnesses or from Mormons. I'm actually, I was actually kind of surprised. My my family, we live, I don't want to say off the grid, but we're off the beaten path. That might be the best way to say it. We're not like in a suburbia area. We're off the beaten path. And one day right around Easter, Jehovah witnesses showed up and gave me literature. I was really surprised. And I, I interacted with them mainly because I was impressed they found my house. So <laughs> we'll see if they ever come back. But yeah, so I, you know, if you're in a, an area where you do have groups, especially ones like those where they're a little bit more proactive towards going and knocking on people's doors, I don't know if I've ever heard of Christian scientists just knocking on people's doors to talk about Christian science, but maybe you're in an area where that happens. Another... I hate to use the word classical because I feel like the study of new religious movements movements are still pretty new. Um, But a part of a more classical definition of cults is this idea of the group being small and isolated from society. So you think of a lot of groups like the Branch Davidians in Waco or Heaven's Gate. These were like pretty small groups. I think Heaven's Gate was like a dozen people less than 20 like it was somewhere in between like 12 and 20 people um you have like heaven's gate or the branch davidians where it's like this small group off the beaten path um jonestown was a pretty big group of people but you know they they ran down to i think it's guyana is where they ended up at um just trying to like escape society you know and that used to be a big part of the classical definition of cults and i do think that there is some merit to that part of the definition of this like small kind of fringe group um there was a really good documentary i just watched recently on hulu it's not an original i to hulu i think it's from a and e originally it's called cult justice and uh the show chronicles situations where families were able to get justice for you know the the injustices that they experience while being a part of a cult so it was a, it was a nice show to have like a like a good moral victory at the end of each episode but one of the reasons I really liked this show is that it didn't just deal with the major ones there's plenty of documentaries about Waco Jonestown Heaven's Gate Nexium oh my gosh there's so many Nexium documentaries um but This show dealt, I think it was like eight, maybe nine episodes in this series, like one season long. Every episode was a different cult. Every one of them I had never heard of. And each one of these were really like very small groups. I think there was like one or two that was like, oh, this is actually like a pretty big group. I'm surprised I've never heard of them. Um, But the majority of them were these really small kind of fringe groups in a small seemingly normal town so i do think that there is some merit to this classical element of like fringe isolated group don't be don't don't think that your small town may not be the home to a cult like it is very possible that your small suburban town may have a group that is a bit more fringe there is a gathering of people i don't want to call it a church there is a gathering of people within 20 minutes or so of my house who they're not messianic jewish people um meaning that they are you know messianic jews are uh jewish people 
who have acknowledged Jesus as Messiah, but they still retain a lot of their cultural practices because it's part of their cultural identity. Um, they're not that, but they're like this group of people who are Christians, not Jewish people who believe in Jesus, but just Gentile Christians, but they practice the Jewish law. They have very restrictive views on worship and, um, you know, not just like we only sing the Psalms, but like we only sing songs that our pastor writes. And it's very like hyper monitoring everything that goes on and anything outside of their group is unbiblical, which is another common trait that shows up within cults is it's another important thing to understand is that not only are they fringe and isolated, but they believe in like absolute exclusivity. Um, Like we believe in the exclusivity of Jesus, unless you're a universalist. Um, For those who don't, we believe in the exclusivity of Jesus and uh, they believe in the exclusivity cultists believe in the exclusivity of their group. Um, and Jesus may be a part of that group, or it may be a person claiming to be Jesus. Um, but there's this exclusivity within their group. So it's another thing to be aware of. Anyway, so, you know, here I am in like this kind of off the beaten path, kind of suburban area. And there's basically a cult running right up the 20 minute road from me. One thing though, that doesn't work with this classical definition element of, um, the fringe isolationist part of the definition is the internet. I don't know if you've ever heard of it before, but the internet, um, and social media and websites has created an entire, new it's created a whole new element to the game i've talked about i just talked about in the last episode how the late 1800s and the 1960s seemed to be like these two points in history that ended up being a breeding ground for new religious movements i'm wagering with good money not bad money but good money that in the year of our lord 2020s the 2020s um, this is now going to be the next big breeding ground for new religious movement. And a lot of that has to do with social media. You no longer have to be in the same small isolated place with somebody. Case in point, you listening to this episode right now, you're not, unless you're my wife who's sitting in the room playing Stardew Valley while I record this, um, you don't actually have to hang out with me to hear me talk about this thing. And yet I have a quote community of people who support the show, who listen to the show, who, you know, and that's like a big thing within content creating is creating a community. Um, and there's plenty of cults who are operating almost solely through online means and build communities and followings that way. So this idea of like fringe and especially isolated, that's still probably part of the equation, but the internet is changing the game when it comes to cults. I've been going for almost 15 minutes now (laughs) and we're still just working on understanding a definition of what a cult is. So what are some things, whether you're, you've got a knock on your door and it's somebody in a, (laughs) it's somebody in a Jehovah witness suit, or, you know, maybe you stumble upon a thing on social media while you're scrolling TikTok or reels or shorts or whatever. Um, What do you do? What do you say? What do you not do? What do you not say? One thing to remember, we talked about this last year when it comes to Jehovah Witnesses specifically, but I think this might be true of navigating conversations with people that you don't agree with in general. Um, Don't take the strong offensive stance. Be willing to just listen and ask questions. And every Theo bro listening goes, what do you mean not be offensive? I want to stand for the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I want to get in their face. How dare you tell me not to get in their face? Okay, get out of my face, Theo bro. And listen, if you want to play, 
I don't want to say that. That sounds very cheesy. If you actually want to like build a relationship relationship with somebody and actually want to care about them and maybe disciple them like we are called to do in the Bible, then being an offensive jerk doesn't work. That's that's just you flaunting your zealousness. That's just you trying to trigger people. Trying to actually get to know a person and to spend time with them, that will yield fruit, okay? Like, don't be a jerk. I don't know why this is so hard for people. Don't be a jerk. Talk to people. Don't treat people like the enemy, okay? And especially when it comes to the case of like Jehovah Witnesses, and I think this is also true of people who are Mormons, is that if you take that more offensive stance, they'll stop coming. So if you just want to not be bothered, bring up the Trinity. You don't want to be bothered by them? Challenge them on the Trinity. They won't come back. But if you actually want to build a relationship with someone who is also a human being, then you need to listen and ask questions. Don't go in hard even on the questions. Just clarify things. And as you build that relationship, then you can have heftier conversations with people. Okay, so let's start there with don't be a jerk. (laughs) No, understand what a definition of a cult is and don't be a jerk. Okay, step three, know your Bible and pray. Real basic stuff here, right? Understand what a cult is. Don't be a jerk. Pray know your Bible well, okay? We got like a lot of the like basics. I shouldn't have to explain the basics, but here I am explaining the basics. You know, go back and remember, go back and check out the episode, the relationship between faith, reason, and the Holy Spirit when it comes to apologetics. Understand like the Holy Spirit is playing a a role, a huge role in this in this uh, conversation that you may be having with someone who's a part of a cult. Another thing is to understand the basic teachings of the cult, but also not to assume that that person you are talking to believes everything about that cult, okay? There are people out there who are going to be like, you know, 100% sold out for whatever their religion may be, okay? Um, But that's, you know, we have people in Christianity, you know, there are plenty of Christians who don't agree about things, even though we're all claiming to follow the same guy. And you know, depending on the kind of, um, depending on the type of cult that you may be dealing with, you may find a little bit of like, you know, differing views on things. It does help, as I have done in these episodes when we talk about cults, to have a basic general understanding of what they teach, what they believe. How do you find out what somebody ha- believes? Ask them. Ask them questions. Be willing to learn. Being willing to learn doesn't mean that you're ashamed of the gospel, okay? Being willing to learn is respectful towards someone. It's beneficial to you as a human just for personal growth, and it will help you to navigate a conversation. So if you're not an expert on a religion on whatever the cult may be, and someone's knocking on your door, ask them to explain the basics of their religion to you. Also, Google is free. Google will help you with some of those basics. Again, don't assume that every cultist all believe the same thing. There may be a little bit of, you know, some give and take here and there, but there are ways to find out the basics. And again, one good way to find out the basics is not to be a jerk and to ask questions. Another important factor when it comes to uh, navigating conversations with someone who's a part of a cult, and I would say particularly someone who is part of a cult whose system of faith is branching off of some form of Christianity, is to make sure you define your terms. As we have talked about Christian science, like in the last episode, or Jehovah Witnesses, or Branch Davidians, we've seen that 
we use a lot of the same terms. We all talk about Jesus, but who we mean when we say Jesus is going to be different. God the Father is different between all of these groups. It, sin, every uh, all of these important terms that all of us use, all of these faith bases all use, are all using these terms differently. So not like in a mansplaining kind of way. Again, don't be a jerk. But it is helpful to navigate your t- navigate to it is helpful to define your terms so that way you're both on the same page you can continue to learn about another person's cult possibly find new questions to ask and we'll be able to help you you know in how you talk about your faith as well speaking of which again since a lot of these groups do branch off of some form of Christianity, another important uh, t- skill to have or another important um, tool is that when verses are quoted, because they might be, do your research on those verses. Always do your own research. <laughs> Always do research when it comes to verses because there's a good chance they could be ripped out of context which is typically what happens but you need to maybe not it may not be able to be something that you can do right in that moment you know if this is like a casual sit down conversation at a coffee shop jot down some notes jot down those references research them and come back to that person with those with those verses with more questions or your perspective on a verse. Um, Again, you might be, you might even be able to bring up your perspective on a verse. If it's something that you know, well, Um, you know, if they are taking John 14, six to mean something that's way left field, you might be able to bring your perspective on that verse, but always look up how a verse is being used and don't just assume they're using, it's kind of like the terms thing. Don't just assume what they mean by John 3.16 is what you mean by John 3.16. Understand each other. You know, I I talked about back in March when I was uh, giving some of my thoughts on Dianetics that it was like reading another language. There's just all these different terms that mean different things. And there's like this huge glossary in the back of the book. It's, it's so, it was, it was uh, truly, it was like reading another language. I felt so lost. Um, I felt so lost trying to read that book. So it is helpful to define terms so that way you just stay on the same page. You probably won't agree with how the terms or the Bible verses are being used, but just so that way this would be, you know, defining terms, even, you know, just step outside of the realm of apologetics and evangelism for a second and just normal everyday life. Defining terms brings good communication and we want good communication because when there is good communication, people are happy. <laughs> Things get done. There's not unnecessary like agitation going on. This is one of the reasons why, even though I'm a millennial who loves to text, texting is not necessarily the best way to communicate all the time because, you know, you can't understand inflection and, you know, terms might be used differently. Like, We want good communication. And so defining terms and understanding how verses are being used is a way to keep everybody on the same page. Another important thing to keep in mind is, like Dragnet used to say, just the facts, ma'am. Don't get caught up in a lot of the secondary, third-level differences between your faith and that of a cultist. For an example, Jehovah Witnesses don't celebrate holidays. Yeah, the Jehovah Witnesses who came to my house right there when it was Easter, uh, they were inviting me to their r- memorial 
celebration for the death of Jesus, memorial observe memorial observance of the death of Jesus. It wasn't a Easter service. There, they don't celebrate holidays. Don't get caught up in that. Don't don't. That's that's not important. Stick with the important things. Obviously, the things being issues of salvation, the identity of Jesus, you know, these main issues, these like top level issues, these are the things we should be talking about. The Bible, uh, additional outside inspiration even, like these are the things we should be talking about, the terms we should be defining, the Bible verses that we are citing and looking up. The conversation should center more around these top level things rather than whether or not we should be celebrating Christmas. Like that, let's, let's not even, let's, let's stay on target here. Circling back to a moment on the uh, basics. So again, Understand what a cult is by way of definition. Don't be a jerk. Um, you know, know your Bible well. Pray also within that like starter pack there. Emphasize the grace of God and also share your testimony at some point. You know, if we truly believe, I talked about this again, I think that was last week when talking about Christian science. If we truly confess sola gracia by grace alone, we are saved. Then that is part of the not being ashamed of the gospel part is emphasizing the grace that God has given us that we may be saved for is by grace that we have been saved through faith. And, because a lot of times in these cults, there's like a there's a works element towards it, not in a sanctifying way, but in a salvific kind of way. So f- focus on grace. Grace should be part of that top level conversation, um, not not holidays. Grace and sharing your testimony. You know, and I would be interested to hear the story of somebody who is a Mormon. You know, and what it, what would be a Mormon testimony? I don't know if they have testimonies in other new f- religious movements, um, but to hear the testimony of another p- person from another faith system would be interesting. But share your testimony. Share the work of Jesus in your life, in salvation, in continuing in your relationship with Jesus. What has that looked like over the years? Because not only does not only is sharing our testimony a way that we bring glory to God and we continue to profess the gospel towards another person. This is, this is your life and you are sharing your life with somebody. Again, don't be a jerk. Treat somebody with respect, treat them like a human being, share your story with them, be a real human being with that person and invite them to share their life with you. Now, all throughout this, I've been talking about how you need to be asking questions, right? Ask questions. And part of it is asking probing questions or facilitating discussion, clarifying terms, right? But, you know, at some point you might want to ask more of a like a, so what do you think of the Trinity kind of question? Here's the thing. Cultists. Oftentimes, maybe not in every situation, but cultists oftentimes are trained to answer the heavy objections. Those gotcha questions, they're trained to deal with those questions. Kind of like how a lot of apologetics courses are there to train you on how to answer the gotcha questions that people ask Christians. We're all just using the same playbook, aren't we? (laughs) So be prepared that you might think you have this real zinger of a question. You're going to ask, you're going to be the one person who's going to ask the one question that this cultist has never thought about before, and you're going to rock their world for the gospel. Here's the thing. There is a good probability that they have been trained to deal with those gotcha questions and are going to flip a gotcha question back at you, which means you also need to be prepared for the gotcha questions. Going back to our starter pack, 
know your Bible. And it is okay, I will say this, it is okay that if in the moment you don't have an answer, I, I do believe that the Holy Spirit illuminates the truth of God's word in our lives. So there may be times where we're not prepared to answer and we have something, but you're also a human. So it is also very probable that there will be a time where you don't have the answer at the moment. And that's okay. Because again, if we're going to treat this person like a human and you want to build a relationship with them, then that can lead to another conversation, another time to get coffee or a hamburger or a tacos or whatever, um, where you can come back to some of the questions that they have stumped you with and you can have some time to wrestle with them, pray over them, write out, you know, do some research and be able to come back at them. I don't really like that. Be able to answer their questions, their objections they have brought to you. One last thing here, this is not an all-encompassing how to talk to somebody who is a part of a cult uh, conversation, but one last very important thing is to remember that in most cults, this is probably part of the um, definition that, or a common trait among cults, is that there is a real fear of being shunned there is a real fear within a cult you know part of their a lot of times what ends up happening is that they are told to cut off all ties from people outside of the cult who are you know they're evil they're part of the damned world that's going to hell or something um because they're not part of the group and then when they're alone isolated in the group they see how you know so and so leaves the group and now they're being isolated and treated as an outsider and that can cause real fear within a cult member so keep in mind that if somebody you know you might be having conversations with people for a very with a person for a very long time and a roadblock that you could run into is this fear factor of you know what's going to happen if i leave the group what happened you know they have put their life their spiritual life in the hands of this group this is what they know and if the group is telling them if you leave the group you're damned then that is going to be a big spiritual hoop that they're going to have to go through and also probably get counseling for that um, will possibly keep them from surrendering their life to Jesus, to acknowledging Jesus as Lord. Like this is, this is a reality. This is a factor, you know? So, Again, this is not an all-encompassing list of things that you should do and not do if you run into a cult member, but I think this will uh, do you some, this will definitely help you out. And again, uh, coming back to the definition part that happened 20-something minutes ago now, um, keep in mind that a be, there, the internet is changing the game. So keep the etiquette of social media in mind, you know, which also, which is code for, again, don't be a jerk. Um, it's sometimes probably most of the time debates don't need to happen on social media because not only again, is it difficult to understand somebody's tone through written word? I have come to realize that yeah, a lot of people don't want to talk or debate the thing. They just want to state their opinion and they believe their opinion and they're not here to have a conversation. They're here to state their opinion. Like one thing that comes up in content creating is like whether the comment is good or bad, you should 
interact with every comment because then you can trick the algorithm into thinking you have an interesting thing that more people need to listen to or watch. It's all about tricking the algorithm when it comes to that technique. And I have, you know, I've tried. I I have tried and I've gotten a little bit better at navigating negative comments. But honestly, one, it always ends with people insulting me, telling me that I'm young and naive, which one of those isn't true anymore. I'm 30 now. Um, But the, the, uh, the other thing is just that every single negative comment has come across as you're dumb. I'm right. No one's there to actually like talk. They're just there to state you're dumb. I'm right. So I really think whether it's, you know, talking to somebody who's a part of a cult or just somebody who has a spicy take on the internet, like, I just don't think like commenting on a thing really does anything anymore. No one's not really there to like debate a thing. It's more so just like, I'm right, you're dumb. Or it's just content creators trying to get more engagement. So they post an open-ended question just to get people commenting a bazillion times. That way they can try to trick the algorithm. Don't fall for it. (laughs) Don't, don't fall for it. Anyway, that is it for uh, today's episode, but please, whether it's in the comment section, ironically, of this episode on Facebook and Instagram, or if you want to send me an email, uh, which you can send at email, seminarylife at gmail.com, let me know what are some other important things to keep in mind when navigating a conversation with someone who is part of a cult. Let me know. But until next time, uh, keep in mind, you can always head down to the description of this episode to find links to all the important things. If you would like to financially support the show, you can head on over to buymeacoffee.com slash M-S-L-P-O-D. Everyone, who, you can leave a one-time donation or you can support the show monthly. Everybody who supports the show at the $9 a month tier gets a shout out. So thank you, Lori, for supporting the show. Share this episode with somebody. That's it. That's the whole assignment. Just copy the link and text it to some rando. And that's it. We'll be uh, finishing up our series on apologetics next week. And then here at the end of the month, we have the highly anticipated schools out special before we head to summer school. But until next time, this is Brandon signing off, reminding you as always that theology is for everyone. So keep on studying.